Okay. Okay. Got people trickling in. We'll give that a minute or two for people to join us. I see some cranberry, cranberry people are on. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science on Tap Minocqua Zoom edition. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Carol Warden and I work here at UW Trout Lake Station and I will be your host tonight. Uh, just a reminder, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. And I wanna recognize our partners in Science on Tap and that includes the Monaco Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trout Lake Station, and Oak Fire Pizza of Monaco. Uh, Science on Tap is supported through a grant from the Birmingham Fund uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And tonight we have three ways to watch. You can watch right here on Zoom as most of you are. And when you watch on Zoom, you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, which we will get to a little later. You can also watch on YouTube, but that is not interactive uh, and you can't ask questions through there. But both have links on our website at scienceontapmonaco.org. Or you can watch any event later if you go to our Science on Tap website and we have archived videos and shorts that are about eight to 10 minutes long for each of those events that we do. Okay, and before we get to tonight's uh, guest, the next event we have is on December 1st, and that will be Jeremy Holtz of the Wisconsin DNR talking about Wisconsin and wildlife. And that will be hopefully our first one in a long time that will be in person at Oak Fire Pizza at our usual time, 6.30, on the first Wednesday of the month, December 1st. So we look forward to that, and we will have any updates with that in our email as they come out over the next month. Uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, can everyone find their chat button on the bottom of the screen? And please, please use this to let us know where you are tuning in from. Lando Lakes, Pennsylvania. Anago, Rhinelander, Boulder Junction, Illinois, but they have a home in Manaqua, Madison, great. 
we've got quite a crowd out there from around the region. Lake Tomahawk, I'm betting a lot of these people know something or two about cranberries. Cool. Okay. Oh, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wolverines are all right. Okay, tonight we have Leslie Holland to tell us about cranberries and fungi. Leslie Holland is an assistant professor and uh, extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Plant Pathology. Leslie's research programs focus on the diagnosis, biology, and management of pathogens affecting fruit production in Wisconsin, specifically with cranberries, apples, grapes, and other specialty fruit crops. Uh, we, she uses basic and applied research to address disease challenges of fruit production and translates these findings into practical information for stakeholders out there. Um, and these research projects are driven by grower needs. Research interests include fungal disease complexes, fungicide and bactericide resistance, biological control, cultural and chemical management. Uh, Leslie grew up in Ohio, but did not realize her love for plants and the microbes that infect them until her college graduate school years out west. She completed her Bachelor of Science at New Mexico State University, her Master's in Science at, in Plant Pathology at Washington State University, and then received her PhD in Plant Pathology at the University of California in Davis. So per our tradition, here is your trivia story about Leslie. During Leslie's second year in graduate school, she was working in the laminar flow hood one evening in the lab. She was working with ethanol to sterilize her work surface and paper towels to wipe it down. There was also a flame, a Bunsen burner going in the hood. Long story short, an alcohol soaked paper towel lit on fire, but Leslie did not see this and proceeded to throw it in the trash can next to her. A few moments later, she saw the orange flame shooting out of the corner of the trash can and its contents were on fire. Leslie panicked and ran to the fire extinguisher. It took all but one pull to extinguish the fire, but the entire lab was filled with the powdery substance in the extinguisher and made a huge mess and a bad smell. The night of this fire was the same exact night of a recruitment event, just down one floor below. So uh, new faculty and that department was present. So Leslie had to run down to the department chair who was at that event and report that she accidentally started this fire. Very embarrassing. Even though she put out the fire, Leslie still had to call the fire department on campus the next day to report that a fire occurred. But in her nervousness, rather than reporting that the fire was extinguished, she reported that fire to be what? Which of these adjectives did Leslie assign to her fire? Relinquished, distinguished, or exterminated? And uh, you should see a poll pop up on your computer with those three choices. And we will show those results from all of you online in a few minutes. OK. So now we have Leslie Holland and uh, her presentation about cranberries and fungus. Great, uh, hopefully everyone can just see my slides on the screen. Yes, it looks good and we can hear you just fine. Perfect, okay, well good. Well, nothing like starting a presentation off with a slightly embarrassing story. Uh, I think everyone should be happy to know I haven't started any fires since starting my program at UW and I'm very proud uh, of that. So let's hope we can keep <laughs> that consistent over time. So I'm really excited to be here. I wish I could be in person with everyone, especially because I heard that you know we get to talk about science and drink beer. So sad to be missing out on that with everybody, but really excited to, to talk a little bit about cranberries uh, this evening, as well as the fungi that infect them. So for my talk, I uh, the title is Pass the Cranberries, but Please Hold the Fungi, right? And I think this talk is really exciting because we're coming up on Thanksgiving. So what better topic to talk about than cranberries? And of course, I'm going to trickle a little bit of pathology in there for you as well, because, well, it's what I do, so I can't help myself. So before we talk about some of the history of cranberry production, I think it's important to talk about what is an actual cranberry. 
serrate their fruits. Uh, they're part of what's called this ericaceous plant family. Uh, and this is a pretty unique plant family. There's other similar uh, crops include blueberry. So they have these very unique associations, sometimes with fungi, so mycorrhizae, which are fungi that impact the root systems. Um, but also they're really known to grow in acidic environments. And so cranberries are grown in these uh, these marshes or bogs, depending upon where you are. Uh, and these are very acidic kind of peat sandy environments. Uh, so I've just got this photo here just to kind of talk briefly about the anatomy of a cranberry plant because they're quite different than a lot of other fruit crops we may encounter. So they have what are called uh, runners, which are essentially these just long horizontal um, spurts of growth. And so from these runners, uh, uprights are born, right? So these are these vertical uh, stems essentially that come off of these runners and uprights can bear fruit like we see here, uh, but they can also just be vegetative, right? So they don't always have to bear fruit. And in fact, they tend to alternate uh, year after year. And if you look at the root system of these cranberries, right, these really fine looking roots, it's really shallow. Uh, it's, it's not a very tall crop. In fact, typically the canopy of cranberries are four to six inches perhaps when you're actually in a bed. So they're, they're a very short but densely packed uh, vine crop. Um, they do require a chilling period. So Wisconsin is a great place to be if you're a cranberry uh, as they're very cold hardy. Uh, and the interesting thing about cranberries is you can probably imagine uh, while they're now consumed, right, more than just uh, one day of the year, there was definitely a time or there still is a time when they're probably the most consumed uh, during one day each year. And that happens to be Thanksgiving. So that's a very, again, a unique thing with cranberry. So they have a really interesting history. And in fact, they're actually one of the very few uh, fruit crops, crops for that matter, that are native to North America. And so this food was recognized as a really important food source uh, for the Wampanoag people. And this was back in the 16th century. So this fruit was being, these are wild cranberries that are being harvested uh, using, uh, using them for food. So they would make different mixtures of the berries with animal fat and this food would last a long time and provide a great resource. Uh, additionally, fruits were also gathered and used in medicines, right? I think they were used to prevent, um, I've seen bloodborne illnesses all the way to scurvy. So right, kind of these magical antioxidant berries possessing some really impressive qualities. Um, and then finally, they were also used for dyes, which is interesting. And that makes sense because of the that bright kind of red color of the fruit. So a lot of different uses um, and really importance for hundreds of years. So uh, moving on to somewhat of the 17th century now, uh, when the pilgrims came, they were introduced uh, to cranberries uh, and they tended to see them in these very marshy uh, peat bog environments, right? And so they were typically seeing the small fruited cranberry, but they noticed it did really well there. Uh, and so, in fact, this is uh, kind of leading to its cultivation, seeing the success that it had in these particular environments. Uh, and sometimes they had a name for them that wasn't cranberry. And I think this is part of an interesting uh, factoid, if you will, for cranberries. They used to be called cranberries um, at some point. So just kind of adding an E uh, in <laughs> instead of cran cranberries, right? And so they were called this because uh, they tend to have this hooked pedestal, right? The pedestal is what uh, the flowers are, are born on similar to the hook neck of these cranes. Uh, so, and I think the cranes are also kind of omnipresent within the marshes and probably consuming some of the berries as well. So they had this name of crane berries before we later dropped the E and are now cranberries. So that's always interesting. And if you go out to most marshes now, you still tend to see a, a small family of these sandhill cranes. And so that's always a fun ecosystem look into a cranberry marsh. So in terms of cultivation, right, so this is, again, hundreds of years later after they've, after they've first been acknowledged as this really excellent food source with a lot of uh, really medicinal properties. So they were first cultivated um, in 1816, and this was in uh, North Dennis, Massachusetts. Uh, and so this actually, uh, this cultivation was attributed to uh, Henry Hall, Captain Henry Hall. So uh, he had lived in Massachusetts and uh, after he retired as a captain, he noticed that he was uh, seeing all these vines that were producing really vigorously, these really beautiful cranberry fruits. Um, and in particular, he also noticed that the areas that the cranberry fruits were being best produced, if you will, were actually in areas where there was wind causing sand to kind of 
drive onto these, these areas of the marsh. And so long story short, this has actually now resulted in a practice called sanding that most growers use today every three to four years to kind of serve as like a rejuvenation to the vines. And so this was just purely from an observation made all the way back uh, in early 19th century. So since then, it's been cultivated in New Jersey, uh, Wisconsin, and then Oregon and Washington as well. So since then, cranberry has really been a growing industry. It's a very awesome industry to work with um, and just see the, its evolution over time. Uh, so by the late 19th century, early 20th century, you're starting to see a fair amount of grower associations being formed. So New Jersey, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, of course, right? So these, these groups are being formed and they serve as a way to keep growers in the loop um, for growers to communicate with one another. Uh, later down the line, we also start to see the development of research stations. And so there's one pictured here to the right in Massachusetts. Um, and most recently we have a research station in Wisconsin in Black River Falls. Uh, and so these research stations are a really excellent place for folks like myself uh, to do research and ask important questions that we can take uh, carry out in a marsh that's not necessarily a growers marsh. So later down the line uh, we started to see IPM programs be developed too and so that was an exciting uh, thing especially as we think about and are concerned about diseases or pests or really just how to manage cranberries in the best way. So these IPM programs started to develop uh, by 1930, Ocean Spray Cranberries was formed, and this is a grower-owned marketing cooperative. And then by the 1980s, 1990s, we were seeing more juice products coming from cranberry, not just our traditional sauce, as well as products, the sweet and dry, like the craisins that you might see in the store. And so this was a really interesting time, uh, kind of that diversification of the cranberry industry, uh, because right, we kind of know it as this traditional side dish that we have at Thanksgiving, right? And so really this diversification of this industry came essentially on the heels of what's being dubbed or what is called the cranberry scare of 1959. Uh, and so in 1959, several, several days before Thanksgiving, the Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare at that time, Arthur Fleming, actually announced that a pesticide, specifically an herbicide, was detected in cranberries, uh, cranberry fruits and that it's actually a known carcinogen. And so this announcement in itself completely just, it just turned things on its head, right? So cranberry crops that were gonna just be ready for Thanksgiving dinner are now being thrown out because of this particular carcinogen. Uh, when in reality, the amount of cranberry fruits you likely have to eat to have a decent exposure to this was way beyond what you'd see in a serving of cranberry fruits. But just, I think the power of that position and that announcement really turn things on their head, especially for the cranberry industry. Uh, so with that constant association of Thanksgiving and your side dish of, of cranberry sauce, right? Uh, there came a push and a drive to diversify how that fruit's being used. And so we started to see cranberry cocktail come on the scene, right? Later in the 20th century, uh, juice blends, right? Those are some of my favorites growing up as a kid. Uh, and then the other things like the, the sweet and dried. So really understanding that the impact that that had on the industry. And I think how it just drove them to be incredibly innovative uh, to, to use the products for uh, foods outside of Thanksgiving. So one thing I haven't touched on yet is harvest. And so this is a really fun topic. And I think I showed this picture in a lot of my talks for cranberry because this is this was my first introduction to cranberry as a kid growing up. And that was these, these two gentlemen standing in this marsh with their waders on and the juice. This is what I thought cranberries to be uh, year round. In fact, I had no idea that this was only a very specific time of the year. Uh, and this was harvest. So. Harvest is another great place to show the innovation of this, of this cranberry industry. So hand harvesting was how things were done for many years in the beginning, right? And if you can imagine standing in a cranberry bed, looking out ahead of you to just <laughs> so many cranberries, right? Hand harvesting is incredibly laborious. It was backbreaking to bend over to this crop to then harvest fruits. Uh, in fact, there were times where children were let out of school early to help uh, pick cranberries, right? I remember being let out of school early for snow days, but I didn't have to pick cranberries at any time. So just understand the labor that this process involved. So with that, uh, kind of this innovation in harvesting, uh, 
1880s, 1890s, we see what the snap scoop and the wooden scoop. And so these mechanisms, right, they're pretty straightforward. They're used to sweep through the vine to grab the fruits without ripping out or tearing the vine. Uh, and so I've had the pleasure of using an apparatus somewhat similar to this. And I will tell you that I was sore for like two days after trying to scoop cranberries. So I'm really glad that things have advanced since this point. Um, but this was a big advancement. And then 1920 was the first mechanical harvester and that's pictured here. And so this also provided a lot of relief to still kind of that uh, really laborious and tough uh, scooping of the fruits. Uh, it wasn't until around 1947 uh, that we had mechanical dry harvesters show up on the scene. And so these are kind of like, for lack of a better word, a very large lawn mower, probably a lot heavier, uh, that are pushed through the cranberry beds and uh, able to, to pull and collect the, the fruits up into these different layers of the harvester. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the 1960s, there was the first successful water harvest, right? So this is the traditional harvest that we typically see in photos or videos when it comes to cranberry production. Uh, and so that's kind of where we stand now. However, there are growers that still continue to do dry harvest. And this is very important for the fresh fruit industry uh, compared to maybe fruits going for processing in terms of differences in how we harvest. So globally, where do we stand now with cranberry production? Well, uh, it's in quite a few places. Uh, North America, as you can see, is, is really dominating here uh, with US and Canada being top producers. But we also have production in Chile, uh, as well as in Eastern Europe and a little bit in Tunisia as well. So, but as I think everybody already knows, Wisconsin's number one, and I don't mean just in the US, but number one in the globe for cranberry production, right? So this is roughly 21,000 acres across 20 counties shown here on this map. Uh, over 250 growers contributing to this industry. And this, as of last year, contributed to 62% of the global supply. So this is a large industry and has a huge economic impact on the state of Wisconsin. And I also put our, our hardiness zone map here to show you here, just emphasizing that point, like, right? Wisconsin does get very cold, but that's a wonderful thing about cranberries. It's able to withstand that cold. Um, and in fact, has that chilling requirement to, to survive and produce fruit. So what does a typical season look like for cranberry production? Well, let's start, we're heading into winter, right? We just, we kind of just finished, we're finishing up this fall period, right? So winter, uh, the beds are flooded and this flood uh, is used to essentially insulate the fruits to keep them warm, prevent them from, from desiccation or drying out uh, during those kind of cold, uh, uh, dry or windy, wind, uh, windy, excuse me, winter months, right? So this layer of ice helps protect uh, the, the fruits during this period. And Wisconsin, we're able to form ice really well here. It's, it's a bit more of a challenge in places like New Jersey and Massachusetts where it tends to get a little bit warmer um, than it does here in Wisconsin. So I have to remember that when I'm freezing cold in Madison and complaining about it that the cranberries are, are okay, right? So that's the compromise I have to make. <laughs> Uh, so after winter, we head into spring, right? And so there are definitely different activities that go on during the spring. So this is removal of the flood. Uh, oftentimes, some folks are uh, still on frost protection watch. Just we know how weather can be in Wisconsin. So that's always a concern for growers. Uh, spring flooding is also occasionally a practice that is used. Uh, sometimes they're called bug floods or um, trash floods. And these are used to bring water into the bed to bring out kind of just the junk that you don't want in there to head into that growing season that would interfere with the plants, right? So insects or debris from the plant that might harbor certain fungal pathogens, right? That's another practice that we see in the spring. Uh, other practices, right, include fertilization programs are really critical at this period because you're just heading into the next season where you're, you're, you're forming the most critical part of the crop, which is that fruit, right? So heading into uh, the summer, uh, Bloom. Bloom is the big deal. That's the thing that uh, we're, we're watching for constantly. Uh, and this is because we have pollinators out there, right? This is helping make our crop. But also during the summer, we're thinking about things like pesticide applications as well. So for the disease that we're going to be talking about here shortly, fruit rot, this is a time when growers are making very strategic applications to the crop in order to prevent fruit rot uh, from infecting those plants. And then finally, fall, the 
the very picturesque season of cranberry is when we harvest, right? And so as I mentioned before, this can involve both dry harvesting and wet harvesting procedures. It really just depends on the end goal of, of that particular crop or fruit. Uh, and again, with fall, you're again concerned about frost protection during the season as well as temperatures start to drop. So it's a lot of monitoring uh, this crop throughout the year to ensure success and protection of the crop. So now we get to talk a little bit about cranberry fruit rot. And as a pathologist, right, this is kind of the stuff I get a little bit excited to talk about. Uh, even though for most people, especially growers, this is not an exciting topic because it's not a good topic uh, in terms of this issue being in your marshes. Uh, so cranberry fruit rot has a long history in cranberry, arguably as long as cranberry commercialization production itself. Uh, so in fact, shortly after uh, cranberry beds were established in, in a commercial market, uh, fruit rot showed up shortly after that. Uh, in fact, it would maybe take five, potentially 10 years for entire cranberry beds to completely succumb to this cranberry fruit rot disease. Um, and there was a lot of speculation about what was causing this. Uh, there are publications and old notes from uh, uh, grower association meetings talking about what could be the cause of this this fruit rot in the marshes, right? Uh, why are these why are these fruits turning the way that they're turning? Uh, and so one of the first ideas was that the beds were too sour, um, which is ironic considering how acidic these cranberry environments are. Uh, but that was the first hypothesis that the beds were too sour, and so a lime fertilizer was applied to kind of reduce that acidity, um, but it didn't really work. Right? There was no results with this application, um, and so they tried other things. Um, they did notice with this particular fruit rot that there tended to be kind of an infield or pre-harvest stage, and also a fruit rot that uh, existed in storage or post-harvest, right? Um, the relative importance of field rot versus uh, rot in, the, in storage actually just depends on kind of the the where the berries are going after that, right? So oftentimes for processing, if berries are immediately frozen after harvesting, we're not really concerned about storage rot as much uh, versus those going to a fresh market, the concerns are much more uh, intensified uh, in terms of that concern for, for fruit rot at storage. And rot, I keep saying, right, rot, what is rot? It, it's not a great term, it's a really generic term and it's just to really describe this kind of degradation of, of the fruits. And you can kind of see the fruits look a little bit wrinkled, brown, discolored, a um, little lighter, a little darker in some of the fruits. It really just depends. So, so these infections are interesting because they're actually happening while they do manifest on these you know, seemingly ripe looking fruits. They actually happen, as I mentioned before, during that bloom period. So these infections are happening in the flower and usually right maybe June, July timeframe for us in Wisconsin, but it's not until almost nearly the end of the summer, early fall that we're actually starting to see some of these symptoms uh, manifest in the actual fruits themselves. So fruit rot, right? As I mentioned, it was really difficult to try and nail down what was causing fruit rot in the first place. Uh, and so while it was initially unknown, it took a few years before fungi were actually found to be associated with this particular fruit rot disease. And in fact, unfortunately, not just a single fungus, but multiple fungi were identified um, associating with these particular systems on cranberry. And so I've included a couple of photos here that my lab has taken, as well as a piece of artwork from one of my students who's actually working on fruit rot, kind of uh, showing this beautiful picture of this cranberry and then some other smaller photos in the background or images in the background uh, of the different fungi that she's been able to culture from cranberry fruit rot uh, samples. So as you can see here, we get a diversity of fungi, uh, a multitude of symptoms, right? You can see partial healthy tissue all the way to a little bit of dead tissue on the edge. We oftentimes see these little specks on the fruit and this is the, the reproductive structure of the fungus, right? So not only has this fungus now infected this particular fruit, but it's been able to reproduce on that fruit so that it can spread to other 
fruit potentially, right? So this would be a, a really big concern if, you're, if your fruits are in storage and they're not stored at the proper temperature, uh, this could lead to the spread of that particular fungal disease. So we call this a disease complex simply because there are at least 12, if not more fungi associated with this particular disease. And unfortunately, just by looking at the fruits in the field, we cannot diagnose one from the other. So in order to do this, we have to use plating, which is what you're seeing right here uh, in this top right corner of the screen. So we bring in fruits to the lab and put them on artificial media so that we can determine what's coming out of them, so to speak. Uh, and finally, not to overwhelm me with too much pathology, but like I said, it's kind of my thing. Uh, I just wanna talk briefly about one more uh, disease on cranberry that's come up uh, within the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, right before I started <laughs> my position, in fact. So you may have heard of the variety Stevens uh, for cranberry. It's widely planted, I think probably still dominates the industry today, even though we are starting to shift uh, in varieties a little bit. And so Stevens variety, uh, very popular. It was actually brought to the scene in part uh, because of its resistance to a particular disease that essentially devastated the cranberry industry almost 100 years ago. And this disease is called false blossom. This isn't caused by a fungus, it's actually caused by a, a bacterial uh, pathogen that infects the, uh, um, the plant tissue and causes really kind of wonky or weird symptoms. And so remember we talked about before with the pedicels of the flowers kind of hooking or arching over, oftentimes we don't see that. The pedicels become very erect, the flowers aren't that beautiful white color, they tend to get very dark pink to red, sometimes they don't even form. Uh, so you start to see kind of these um, mis misshapen uh, fruits, or excuse me, flowers, and then sometimes fruits if fruits are formed at all. And so this particular pathogen is actually spread by a little insect called a leaf hopper, which is uh, pictured at the top here as well. Um, and so this is another disease that we've recently started to study in my program um, because it's so serious due to the fact that it can actually cause the abortion of the fruits, which means no yield, right? And so it's really important that we start to figure out management strategies for this uh, particular disease that did devastate the industry all those years ago. So I think with that, I will leave it at the pathology note and hopefully answer any questions that, that folks may have. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, before we get to the question and answer part, let's find out how Leslie described her fire to the fire department. So here are our poll results. And most people answer correctly. It was a very distinguished fire, black tie, top hat and all in that hood. So now it wouldn't be science on tap, of course, without the questions. Uh, so we're relying on the audience to ask those questions. So here is where you can find and click on your Q&A question at the bottom of your screen. And this is the window that you should write your questions in. And then us here will be monitoring those questions and we will bring them up and ask Leslie as they come up. So. One question, our first question is, where did the bulk of cranberries harvested in Wisconsin go? To juices, sauces, craisins, or something else? That's a great question. So the bulk of the cranberries harvested here do go to processing. Uh, now, we don't know their respective splits in terms of juice to, to craisins or sweet and dried. Um, I don't know the respected uh, divisions there, but most of them go to processing. A very small percentage of them actually go to, to fresh fruit. Okay. Uh, can you comment on why commercial bogs are so productive compared to wild cranberry bogs? My two boys and I, the person asking, my two boys and I picked wild cranberries on a local bog a few years ago and harvested about two cups in two hours. After cooking, they tasted identical to commercial cranberries. Absolutely. Wow, that's that's not a lot of uh, cranberries for that much work. I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting, right? I mentioned it is this native crop, but in these commercial systems, we're really able to take, I think, all of the things that 
you know, decades ago, people, hundreds of years ago, people noticed that made cranberries so successful, right? These sanding practices, uh, giving them that, that winter time under, under the ice and now giving them nutrients and fertilizer and water, right? All these specifically timed things. Additionally, when you're dealing with a native plant, you're also dealing with all the native things that potentially can impact that, whether it be pest or diseases, right? So I think in systems that are commercial, we're able to manipulate and tweak them in a way that allows us to push uh, higher yields and protect them more from potentially other elements. So sure. it's my best guess at that one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, before we move on, could we just have you do your shot, your stop screen share, and then we'll come in as a bigger picture. There we go. All right. Uh, another question is, are there still wild cranberries in Wisconsin? I suppose we have an inkling from our last question. <laughs> Yes, there are. I have yet to visit and sample them, but actually I'm my student and I who's working on the Cranberry Fruit Rep Project are very interested in looking at uh, more of those kind of very native natural populations of cranberries that have not been put into commercial production. Uh, just out of curiosity to, for us to look at the microbes that are associated with those versus the microbes associated in commercial systems where they actually see fungicides and a lot of other practices that we, we wouldn't expect to see. So still there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we picked some the other day, actually, at a little bog lake right down the road. And uh, I thought they were great. They weren't even too tart. They were, it was a special treat. <laughs> uh, another question, how long does a stand last? Talk to us about viral problems uh, in the perennial. How long does the stand last and about viral problems? That I am not clear. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, it can vary. I mean, I've heard of some, you know, maybe being 80 years old, I'm sure they can live beyond that too. And I'm sure that that takes really consistent practices of standing every few years to kind of reinvigorate uh, those vines. But yeah, for decades, for perhaps over a hundred years, none that I've seen personally, but they can live for a long time. Um, in terms of the viral question, um, so viral diseases of cranberry showed up not too, too long ago. Um, and when they did make their way kind of on the scene of cranberry, they have some pretty, pretty ugly, ugly symptoms, right? They, they really distort uh, what the fruits look like, which is not great when you're, when you're trying to harvest and bring quality fruits in. Um, and so in terms of the long-term impacts, I truly don't think we know because the unique thing about the viral diseases of cranberry are that the fruits are actually able to recover in some way uh, from the infections, right? So uh, you might see really ugly symptoms and uh, deal with some fruit loss with the viral diseases that first year, but years following that, uh, it has been demonstrated that those plants tend to recover. So, which is very unlike the false blossom disease caused by that bacterial where they don't recover, right? And that's a huge problem. So I think, well, viral diseases aren't great. Uh, I think it's become understood that if you get them, there is the possibility of the plant feeling better, getting better, so to speak. So different biologies there. And up here, we know that uh, the wild ones anyway, grow with other plant species that have antiseptic properties. So I wonder if they're sharing ideas there. In the wild. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have two common species of cranberries in our natural bogs and peatlands here in Wisconsin. Is one of these species the original species that was cultivated, that was used for cultivated cranberries? So that's a good question. Um, I don't know if it's the original, but I know, so we have what's called the small cranberry and the large American cranberry. And so the large American cranberry is what, is what has been cultivated and used in commercial production. So, um, but we do still have the small cranberry available um, or out there, I guess I should say. So, but it is, in, as far as I understand, it is not what is being cultivated. Got it. Uh what research questions are being addressed at the Black River site? Good question. So the Black River site uh, is relatively new. It's a beautiful station. If you're ever in the area, I encourage you to visit. Uh, so right now, I think maybe, at least for my research uh, underway, we're actually looking at dynamics of fungal presence in a cranberry bed, but there's also uh, other research in horticulture specifically looking at breeding, that's another big area, and then pest control as well is another big area in terms of what chemistries 
uh, are working, when to apply them to control certain pests. So there's a diversity of research going on. And like I said, it's relatively new. So I think a lot of us are still uh, transitioning to doing research there and, and having our questions answered, hopefully, with those beds. Cool. Can you comment on how cranberries are measured by barrels, by how many barrels per acre is common, things like that? Cranberries are measured by barrels, and it's actually kind of a unique unit. Again, another unique thing about cranberries. So a, a barrel is 100 pounds of cranberries. So that's kind of their, their traditional unit for, for measuring cranberries. So when we talk about a barrel, we think about 100 pounds, and that's typically how they're, they're measured. Cool. Uh, are there insects that directly attack cranberries to any significant degree? Yes, I believe so. I'm not, not an entomologist, so I don't want to go too off base here. Uh, but yeah, so in fact, I would probably say based on the, the trends that insects are much more of a threat to cranberry than disease are in Wisconsin. Uh, disease pressure, pest pressure really varies from Wisconsin to New Jersey to Massachusetts. And so I would say New Jersey, Massachusetts see a lot more disease than we do here in Wisconsin. Uh, here we tend to actually experience more pest pressure. And that can be through direct feeding, that could be like the vector, that insect that spreads the false blossom, phytoplasma. So we do see direct damage from insects on fruits. All right. Uh, are there any organic cranberry farms in Wisconsin? Yes, there are. I think it's, I don't know the percentage. I think it's relatively low, but we do have organic production of cranberry, so. Great. Any idea where those are, comparatively speaking, regionally? No, I think there's, either. yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So I assume they're, they're probably in little pockets or, you know, maybe a little spread out, sure. but yeah. Uh, how is the cranberry rot controlled? Great question. So I'd say it's really well controlled with the use of cultural practices and the use of fungicides. So with cultural practices, uh, the main thing that a lot of growers try and do to manage this disease is to control moisture, right? Fungal pathogens love a moist environment. And so if we let that canopy, that dense canopy stay really moist, for a really long time, that's not a good idea. So there's a lot of good practices to reduce that canopy moisture, giving it just enough that's good for the plant, but not good for the pathogen. So between that and the use of fungicides, fruit rot has been successfully managed. Uh, there are some varieties, like I think Stevens is a good example, where some growers don't even need to spray a fungicide uh, because disease pressure is so low. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing if you're able to not use fungicides at all in order to, to manage the disease, so. Yeah. Great. Uh, are the fungi involved with cranberry fruit rot soil borne? Good question. So no, none of the path or the fungi involved with fruit rot are actually known to be soil borne pathogens. Now, I will tell you that they do hang out um, kind of at the base layer, what we call a duff layer in cranberry marshes. And so they're going to colonize the uprights and the runners and the leaves, and they can actually survive in those tissues. They can overwinter in those tissues, right? So when that ice layer goes on, the fungi can, they can take their hibernation as well under that ice layer on plant tissue. And then the following season, once things warm up, they can actually serve as a source of what we call an inoculum, which is a way that the, the fungus can move and infect again. So not in the soil, but they do live in old or new plant tissue. And if they hang out there long enough and that's not removed from your cranberry bed, that can actually serve, serve as a source of new infections. Mm. Okay. Uh, cranberry farms has special water quality laws. What are these and how long have they been in place? That is an excellent question. Unfortunately, I cannot answer that. I can agree that yes, they do, but I, I don't know those laws. I apologize. Fair enough. <laughs> um, how does the water harvesting work? What's that process? That's a great question too. So I saw this for the first time last year and it's incredible because man, cranberries are awesome. So I think I, I showed you in a previous slide that, uh, that this the picture my student had drawn of kind of, they have these four pockets and that allows them to flow. And that's really integral to how cranberries are harvested. So right. when they're ready to go, there's a little bit of water that gets put in the beds and they have these 
types of equipment that can drive into the beds with like beaters on them and they just slowly kind of hit the, the fruits off of the vines that are naturally floating upwards because of those air pockets. Uh, and those come off, a little bit more water goes in and then all those berries are essentially corralled to the edge of a bed and, and harvested. So the, the unique uh, design of the cranberry, if you will, really allows it to be harvested the way that it does, right? You're not missing cranberries that are sinking to the bottom. They have those air pockets that allow them to float to the surface. And oftentimes you're harvesting in the direction, right, of the, of the prevailing wind, right? So you're moving with nature, right? Okay. If the berries are heading this way, you corral them this way and take them up. So it's it's, it's kind of magical. <laughs> yes, and anytime I've picked one in the wild, I'm still always surprised at how light it is in my hand when I'm holding it. It's yes, yeah. Very, very floatable. Uh, let's see. Uh, can a cranberry farm divert water from a stream for flooding? Divert water from a stream for flooding? For I flooding don't know, the so cranberry so bogs. Yeah, so normally they, they, they have these reservoirs of water and that is what they primarily use to flood. And they, I don't have a good picture uh, in my presentation, but they essentially just take wood blocks off that allows to kind of bring in or, or take out water. And that's essentially how they're moving water out of these reservoirs for flooding, so. Great. Okay, you mentioned that the plant oscillated from vegetation to fruit year to uh, vegetation of fruit year to year. Uh, is that on a per plant basis or for an entire bog or something different altogether? And are there large production years and then off years? So I, I would assume it's probably on a plant by plant basis, right? I think that it's just going to alternate based on that particular upright, what it was the previous season. Um, in terms of do they alternate bare I think slightly. I don't know how much of an influence that is in the overall yield or harvest that uh, folks would get, but I think that there is a slight alternate bearing of, of, of that fruit, so. All right, uh, do you happen to know what the history is of craisins becoming a thing? I know, I don't know the history of them. I know that was definitely part of an effort to kind of diversify production after that massive scare that, that happened in 1959. Mm -hmm. I think that adding that level of sugar in fruits, right, I think it makes it a lot more palatable to people who maybe don't want a really bitter fruit or a really bitter juice without sugar. So um, I think it's part of that larger overall effort uh, to diversify how cranberries are being processed and used. But no, I don't. I love craisins, though. I know. I, for one, think they're a great invention. Yes. I like to throw them in every kind of granola or yeah, the wild rice we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Great. Huh. Um, please describe how a commercial blog is prepared and the soil type and things like that. Maybe okay. know anything about how it's built. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best again, a little outside of my area. Um, but so beds are actually being renovated quite a bit in Wisconsin, I think, as new varieties go in. And so in terms of the basics, which is probably all that I can give you, right? Like I said, they're very, these sandy beds, they're outfitted with irrigation oftentimes. So these long irrigation lines that will end up uh, making these sprinkler heads, right? So irrigation, uh, sprinkler irrigation is often used to really meet the water needs of uh, plants, but also in the summer, like the summer we just had, which is particularly hot and dry, they're used a fair amount to to keep the plant from from desiccating and getting and getting what it needs. So you've got kind of a sandy bed. You've got the irrigation lines in there, uh, and then in terms of actually how the the cranberries start, if you will, most of the time they start from cuttings. And it's again another really unique thing about cranberries, right? Uh, you can get little plantlets or you know uh, of cranberry from a nursery, but oftentimes uh, a lot of growers are actually able to kind of cut through or, or mow almost uh, cuttings, these short cuttings of the vine. And then those are put into the sand to establish a bed, given some good irrigation, kind of pushed in a little bit, and then so begins a cranberry bed, right? We're not going to go to a nursery and get a tree and plant it in a very uniform spaced way. Cranberries are they're, they're kind of like rough and ready crops in a weird way. And it's, it's been so successful with their, their really viney and dense growth. And of course, those first couple of years probably look a little bit sparse as, as the bed you know, needs time to fill out. 
but yeah, they, they can go in straight from a, an older bed. So hopefully yeah, that's that answers they, a little bit. They are rough and ready. They're handling these winters year after year. Yeah. Uh, how do you differentiate between opportunistic, like secondary fungal infection versus the primary infection or a, path a pathogen initiation with all those species that you find? That's a really wonderful question. Uh, it's difficult. It's really difficult. So with cranberry fruit rot, we do know we have 12 well-defined species uh, associated with rot symptoms. And so we kind of, we put those in their group of like, okay, we know these are true pathogens of our cranberry plant and not just endophytes, but we pull out a lot of en other endophytes, other fungi that come out of, of these fruits that aren't necessarily pathogens. Um, and so we tend to kind of cluster those off to the side. We do still try and identify those, but when we do isolations, we really focus on what's the dominant fungi showing up for us. And in Wisconsin, we don't get all 12. It's rare that we get all 12. Most of the isolation plates that we do in the laboratory really have shown us two to three different fungal species dominate fruit rot that we see. And that's, that's been relatively consistent. Uh, and so I don't know if they're better competitors. I don't know if they're getting in at a really strategic time that maybe they outgrow some of the other 12 you know, fungi showing up. Uh, but we tend to see a few dominate uh, fruit rot and you might get it the occasional, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh one showing up somewhere, but it really does seem to be dominated by a few pathogens. Great. Uh, blueberries get witch's broom, which I think is a fungal disease that spreads from fir trees. Are there similar shared fungi affecting cranberries? So yes, there are shared fungi affecting cranberry. A cranberry can get a witch's room. It's actually caused by that uh, phytoplasma I mentioned at the end, that false blossom causes mm. that witching, witch broom symptom of the uprights. So, but yeah, so colitotricum is a fungus. Um, actually, it's the fungus I, I showed you on one of the slides, kind of pink grayish with orange spores. To me, it's beautiful, but I, I realize that's not a common <laughs> opinion <laughs> outside of pathology. Um, but blueberry also gets that same fungus and it can cause a very similar disease on the fruits, making them kind of gross and mushy and can also infect the, the twigs as well uh, of blueberry. So yeah, I think right having that very similar family relation, they do encounter and deal with a lot of the same fungi. All right. Uh, how many cranberry varieties exist and do they vary in pathogen resistance? Good question. To the number, again, that's something I don't know. I'd say there's a lot. I feel like I learn about a new one every time I, you know, interact with a grower or go to a marsh. I learn about a new one. Um, so in terms of their relative resistance to fruit rot, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, there has been work uh, in, in breeding, especially out of New Jersey, where they've tried to look at different levels of resistance to these particular fruit rot fungi. Um, but it becomes, becomes complicated because you are dealing with a multitude of fungi, right? It's often easy to study one or two, but 12 becomes very complicated. So in those resistance assays or looking at resistance, an important factor really comes down to the fruit itself, how it's able to withstand uh, a particular fungus. Uh, right, so it might not be that the fungus can't get into the flower, so to speak, but that fruit can actually bear and not and not crumble under the stress of infection. Uh, so there are some varieties that seem to be less affected. Like I mentioned, Stevens before. I've heard a lot of growers not have to use fungicides on Stevens, which is great. And so uh, whether that's not a resistance thing or it just happens to be a side effect of Stevens that they don't require fungicides, where some of the newer hybrid varieties do tend to, we do tend to see more fungicide use in those. Um, and I don't know if that's a matter of less resistance or some of the new hybrid varieties have like slightly, slightly increased nutritional needs, right? So that means more fertilizers, more inputs to those plants. Um, and right, fungi are going to try and get where the getting's good, so to speak. And so if there's more inputs on, on those, right, they're gonna try and benefit off of that. So uh, resistance is a bit of a tricky one, but there have been some successful developments, I think, out of that New Jersey uh, breeding program, so. Okay, uh, and, a, and a related question, has CALS at the university looked at the genetics of wild cranberries and how these wild genes could benefit today's commercial plants? 
Yes, I believe they have. So that's not my area. I believe we have a breeder who's with USDA Juan Zalapa. And so his research group, I think, has been leading that effort in terms of breeding and especially going back to those more native uh, populations and looking for sources of resistance. So, which is a really common mode of looking for resistance in plant species, right? Go back to the plants that are hanging on and, and doing pretty well that started out well. <laughs> Are any of the pathogens harmful to humans if they're ingested? Great question. No, nothing that I've that I've seen uh, on any of these pathogens. So, which is great. I mean, they tend to impact the plant. Um, I think maybe if you ate a bunch of cranberry rotted fruit for whatever crazy reason you'd want to do that, you'd probably get like an upset stomach. But there's okay. not really any toxins produced with this group of fungi. So, right. How did you decide to focus on cranberries and cranberry, cranberry fungi in particular? Well, uh, so my background is in studying fruit pathology in general. Uh, and then when I uh, got the position here at UW-Madison, cranberries are the leading fruit crop in the state. Uh, and so with that, it just it was hand in hand to, to study these two things. And fruit rot in particular uh, has been a focal point of control as I mentioned, since cranberries have been around, right? And so while we do, we are able to manage it well, we are coming up against some issues in terms of reductions in the amount of chemistries that we have available to control these pathogens, right? So for me, part of my research program is trying to investigate uh, either other means of control, whether they be cultural or other chemistries that we can use uh, that broaden our scope so that we can avoid what's called fungicide resistance, right? We don't want to get to that point uh, in these production systems. So that kind of pulled me into the dark side of pathology, but also the exciting side of the fruits. Uh, another question, what is your favorite cranberry recipe? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> So, you know what I will say, <laughs> uh, we had a lot of cranberries on us last season uh, to, to try and make good with, and I'm not very creative in the kitchen in terms of sweets, although I love sweets. Uh, my student actually made cranberry scones with orange, like, the, like an orange flavoring with them as well. So I think it was just a recipe from online. So I cranberry scones with like a hint of, of orange, that's, that's my recommendation. It's really good. That sounds great. And I have one final question of my own. I was curious, culturally, um, if you got any buzz in your work, in your field of work, a year or so ago when the whole TikTok cranberry, ocean spray cranberry juice exploded. Yeah, you know, nothing changed for me in that regard. I still don't skateboard, but I still drink cranberry <laughs> juice. So it's <laughs> That's, that's half the battle, right? Uh, no, unfortunately, I didn't. But you know, it, yeah, it was it was a great year for for Canberra, a lot of popularity. Yes, for sure. It was fun watching the different iterations of it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much to Leslie Holland for joining us tonight, and thanks to everyone who participated, especially those who wrote in for questions. And to our sponsors, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Monaco Public Library, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trail Lake Station, and the Brittingham Foundation, and now Oak Fire Pizza of Monaco. And remember, our next Science on Tap is Wednesday, December 1st at 6.30 in person, hopefully, with Jeremy Holtz speaking about Wisconsin wildlife at Oak Fire of Monaco. And we'll encourage guests that do come in person to uh, wear masks if they are not eating or drinking, if you feel more comfortable that way. So 